Hello and welcome to the third lecture of this series. Um, in the last lecture, which was the first part of uh, this particular module, um, I had discussed in detail the black body radiation and uh, we stopped at photoelectric effect. So today we will continue uh, this module from photoelectric effect. Um, Photoelectric effect, in fact, um, provided, I would say, a direct confirmation for the energy quantization of light. Or, in some sense, it was uh, among the first observations made uh, showing that, um, that um, there is energy quantization or energy, the light energy is, is quantized. Um, the behavior was in fact discovered uh, by Hertz in 1887 um, and what he observed that you know the electrons um, emitted uh, from metal surface when the metal was uh, irradiated with light. Um, in fact several observations were made before Einstein pitched in in 1905 and, um, and published this paper on photoelectric effect explaining the, the behavior. For instance, uh, what was shown that um, if the frequency of the light is below a certain threshold frequency and this threshold frequency was found to be a function of metal. Um, sorry about this. Function of the metal. So the threshold frequency was found to be the function of the metal that you choose. So if the frequency uh, of light here, the frequency of light is nu. Uh, nu naught is the threshold frequency, which is a function of the metal that you choose. And if the um, if the incident frequency was less than the frequency or the threshold frequency, there was no electron emission. No matter what, no matter for how long you uh, have the light exposed over the metal surface um, there was no electron emission this was um, found by Philip Leonard in 1902 uh, however if the uh, incident frequency was greater than the threshold frequency uh, there was an instantaneous electron emission no matter what the intensity of the light was so intensity of the light could be anything. It could be a single photon being uh, shined over the metal surface. As far as the frequency of the metal, uh, frequency of the incident light is greater than the, uh, the threshold frequency or the so-called threshold frequency, um, there was an instantaneous electron emission. Um, it was also found that the number of electrons which come out um, were dependent on the intensity, the light intensity, and not on the frequency, whereas the kinetic energy of the electron that comes out was dependent on frequency, not the intensity. Now, if you notice, many of these things are um, very different from what you visualize based on the classical uh, picture of uh, uh, energy exchange between matter and, uh, and radiation. Um, and that's why these experimental findings could not be explained within the context of purely classical physics of radiation, um, particularly the dependence of the effect on the threshold frequency. Um, as you know, according to the classical physics, any I mean continuous amount of energy can be exchanged with matter. Um, that is because the intensity of an electro electromagnetic wave is proportional to the square of its amplitude uh, and any frequency with sufficient intensity can supply the necessary energy uh, to free the electron from the metal. You can think in this way that let's say you have, you have a capacitor and you are trying to store certain energy and let's say there is a threshold uh, uh, generator outside. So beyond the point when you just keep storing charge, uh, which is nothing but the integration over the period of time and beyond the time, beyond the point, uh, the, the capacitor voltage will cross a certain limit and then your threshold generator will trigger. 
so that's the classical picture, right? You are storing charge somewhere and you are building up the energy and then, uh, then that can be used further. But uh, the same um, doesn't work in this case, right? Um, I mean, so at that time, the question was what will happen, let's say, if you use a weak light source. Weak light source means you have very few photons or very few, you know, light particles, um, which you call photon, uh, coming out at a time. I mean, in, in classical sense, weak light source means uh, very dim light, right? Um, so what will happen? I mean, according to the classical physics, uh, an electron will keep absorbing energy as I gave you this capacitor analogy. If you think of uh, uh, electron as a capacitor, uh, so in this case, the electron will keep on absorbing the energy at a continuous rate until it has gained sufficient amount uh, of energy and then, you know, it would leave the metal as soon as it has the sufficient amount of energy, which is higher than, let's say, whatever threshold frequency, it will leave the metal. Uh, now, if this argument is, is true, then... Um, then if you use uh, a very weak light source, then it will not, uh, the electron will not leave the metal instantaneously. It will take a certain amount of time, right? And as you vary the intensity, the, the, the electron emission will uh, be dependent on the time and it will happen at different times. So there should be a, a time of emission versus uh, uh, versus intensity graph, but it was found that as far as the frequency or the uh, the incident frequency is greater than the threshold frequency, no matter what the intensity is, the electron will come out. Um, so. Um, I mean, that was shown by, you know, by doing experiments with extremely weak light sources at that time, uh, with light sources possibly producing few photons at a time. And uh, no matter how weak it is, the electrons uh, would come out. Um, the same thing was done with the frequency. And it was shown that, uh, uh, that I mean, no matter what you do with the intensity, but if the frequency is less than the threshold frequency, uh, the electron will never come out. And that's something which is, again, not following the, the classical uh, uh, laws of physics or the classical explanation of the energy exchange between matter and the radiation. Um, and uh, that's the reason why it was believed that the classical physics uh, basically, the predictions based on the classical physics are are completely wrong, and therefore one need to build uh, a different explanation for this. And that's that's where Einstein um, fished in in 1905. So Einstein was inspired by. Planck's quantization of electromagnetic radiation and uh, in 1905 he kind of succeeds, succeeded in giving a theoretical explanation for the dependence of photoelectric emission on the frequency of the incident radiation. Uh, so what he did, he assumed that light is made of these uh, the, the corpuscles carrying an energy h nu called photons so so you have let's say you have this this metal surface you have this metal surface and let's say the the work function of the metal surface is is w work function is uh, nothing but the energy required for the electrons to leave the metal surface and these are the free electrons which are moving um, freely moving at the surface so you need a certain minimum energy for these electrons to emit uh, or to eject from the surface of the metal and that energy is nothing but the work function. Uh, the work function is related to the threshold frequency 
uh, with this relation work function being h nu naught. So nu naught earlier we saw was the threshold frequency and you multiply this with Planck constant becomes the work function. So coming back to light, so Einstein assumed that the light um, is, is in some form um, basically is, is made of uh, these discrete entities and each entity which he called photon uh, has an energy h nu. So nu is the frequency of the light, the incident light and the energy of each of that, that quantized component or uh, fundamental element which is contributing or which is eventually making this 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 thing light um, which where each of this discrete component called photon uh, you multiply nu by Planck constant and gives you the, uh, the 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 energy of that single unit cell right so this h nu was already there from the Planck time uh, the H was found and therefore the energy of that discrete or that quantized entity would be H nu was already there, right. And uh, now let's say the emitted electrons uh, have a certain kinetic energy which is E. Um, so as we discussed what happened when a beam of light of frequency nu is incident on uh, metal, um, each photon transmits all its energy h nu uh, to an electron near the surface. Now in this process, uh, the photon is entirely absorbed by the electron. Um, the electron will then absorb energy only which is required, you know, uh, to get out um, irrespective of the intensity of the incident radiation and if h nu is larger than metal's work function the energy required to leave uh, or for the electron to leave the metal surface uh, which is uh, uh, which is nothing but the work function which i just told you The remaining energy will stay with the electrons which come out. So in that sense you can write this relation that the incident energy which is uh, h nu should be equals to the work function plus the work function plus the energy of the electron which comes out and now if the h nu now if the h nu is less than work function no electron will come out right so now um, the work function as I mentioned that work function is, is uh, a function of the metal that uh, is under consideration or is under experiment and therefore um, the energy of the electron will also be a strong function of the uh, work function of the metal which is being experimented. So each metal um, has electrons with unique uh, um, uh, threshold frequency. Um, or unique uh, work function where this is nothing but h nu naught and nu naught is the threshold frequency um, which is the minimum energy to knock out the electron and the electrons will come out only if the incident light has an energy h nu uh, greater than the work function. So um, again this was uh, uh, a hypothesis from Einstein. There was no experimental uh, validation of uh, what Einstein proposed in 1905 but uh, the explanation could very well uh, fit into the experimental observations being made before uh, Einstein's uh, findings or Einstein's explanation and therefore it was very well accepted. Uh, it also fitted very well with 
with plants quantization idea so at that time it was very well accepted and uh, uh, then later on um, um, in in 1916 uh, milken experimentally proved uh, that einstein was right um, the setup that you see here this setup is nothing but the setup which many experimentalists uh, uh, including leonard uh, used uh, before Einstein to show this uh, this frequency effect. So uh, what do you see here? You see this is one metal surface on which the light um, is incident. Then this is uh, an inert uh, chamber. Um, so basically the uh, if the electrons are emitted they will move towards uh, the other potential. Uh, so let's say if uh, if this is if this is negative, this is positive. So electrons will leave out of the negative surface, and the electrons will drift uh, towards the positive charge surface. Um, and then you have so this should be this should be positive. This should be negative. Um, and you, then you have a, a bias, uh, which is this, and an emitter, which is to measure current. If there is an electron flow, if electrons come out, there will be an electron flow, and uh, therefore you have uh, an emitter. So now if you, uh, if you have light, which is incident on, on the surface, uh, and if the light uh, frequency, h nu, is greater than the work function of the metal, the work function of the metal then electrons will come out and you measure certain current and if the h nu is uh, is if the h nu is equals to w then the electrons will not have enough kinetic energy or will not have will have no kinetic energy and therefore the electrons cannot drift if the h nu is less than w then of course no electrons will come out and uh, therefore uh, no current will be seen across the emitter so this was the setup used at that time to basically show that there is some relation to uh, to the incident light and you know as i told you that when the the intensity of this light was played no change uh, happened um, um, i mean you will see change in the current but uh, but uh, that was there was no relation with the with the with the wavelength uh, when you play with the intensity so uh, good um, let's now move to the next module but before that let me summarize that this was another experiment where um, uh, or another key finding an observation of that time which basically uh, demonstrated uh, a very interesting um, or very different behavior or very different behavior in terms of light matter interaction which could not be explained with the classical physics and uh, an electron emitting out of the metal surface uh, because of incident light uh, further uh, shows um, a very different uh, behavior or in, in, in some sense the um, the, the the particle like behavior of uh, uh, the light um, which we'll discuss again in the next slides so in um, 1911, uh, Rutherford uh, gave this planetary model for the atom. His model was very simple. He uh, basically assumed that you have the nucleus, which is uh, at the center. Um, so you have the nucleus, which is at the center. And uh, then you have these, um, so the nucleus is, is positively charged. 
and then you have these electrons which are negatively charged and they are revolving or they revolve around the nucleus like you know it happens in the planetary motion um, so this happened you know uh, after the neutron was discovered or the nucleus was discovered and then it was kind of a logical build up further to somehow explain um, then he said okay the electrons are negatively charged the nucleus or the neutrons are positively charged uh, when the nucleus is positively charged you have the neutrons and protons um, so therefore the nucleus is positively charged and therefore the electrons which are negatively charged cannot be inside the nucleus and so the electrons must be revolving around uh, the, the nucleus. Uh, well and good uh, but not completely correct. It explains possibly the hydrogen atom uh, which has one electron but it cannot explain bigger atoms which may have multiple electrons. Um, then uh, in 1913, uh, uh, Bohr uh, pitched in and he said that uh, no, it has to be something different. Um, and again, he borrowed this idea of quantization of uh, energy from Planck's and Einstein's work. And so he again proposed, uh, or I would say it was uh, his hypothesis that instead of continuous orbit as uh, as Rutherford proposed, so Rutherford's idea was that, you know, let's say one electron is revolving in some orbit and the other electron is revolving in some other orbit and the other electron is revolving in some other orbit. Um, Bohr's idea was that in, in place of the continuous orbit as shown by Rutherford, uh, it must be discrete sets of circular orbits with certain energy uh, associated with each of the orbit. So his idea was that let's say you have you know uh, a certain circular orbit for a few electrons, another circular orbit for few other electrons, another circular orbit for another electron and all these orbits must be spaced by a certain discrete or quantized energy, a fixed energy gap. Uh, so when they are quantized, when they are spaced by discrete or fixed energy gap or quantized energy gap, we are also telling that the angular momentum, uh, which is a function of this, this uh, number uh, n, uh, would also be uh, in the integer multiples. Uh, so if the electron remains, his idea was that the electron remains inside a given orbit, um, then it would not radiate energy. Uh, emission or absorption um, of the energy or the light will happen only if the electron jumps from one orbit to the other orbit and that emission or absorption will be because of the change in the energy of the electron moving from one orbit to the other orbit uh, and therefore the energy emitted or absorbed by the photon um, would be uh, e n minus e m equals to h nu. So let's say if h nu is the emitted photon, then e n would be an energy state which is higher to e m. So let's say if this is e n and if this is e m and if the electron jumps from this orbit to this orbit, there will be a photon emitted and this photon is h nu. So h nu is nothing but this energy minus this energy. So again, I must emphasize that uh, these are all ideas. Um, what Bohr explained was his, uh, um, I mean, based on a hypothesis which is which he made, uh, based on the understanding he developed. Uh, or inspiration he uh, got from Einstein's and the Planck's work. Uh, he also gave uh, Bohr's radius, uh, which you will find in textbook uh, often with the with term R zero or A naught, uh, and the Bohr's radius was uh, very close to what quantum mechanics predicts. But again. 
um, while many of these ideas were further validated later on using the mathematical formulation established uh, for quantum mechanics. Um, uh, but the numbers which were proposed by Bohr, you will see later that those numbers were not accurate, but uh, the estimated numbers were very close to what Bohr has calculated based on his, his understanding of, of, of the quantization of energy and these quantized uh, orbits. So many of these things you will see later that uh, can be very well uh, validated with, with the quantum mechanics. Uh, the idea of, uh, of multiple orbits, the idea of each orbit having discrete quantized energy, um, the idea of uh, a photon being emitted uh, if there's an electron which jumps from the outer orbit to the inner orbit and vice versa, the idea of Bohr's radius uh, and so on where um, uh, or even for instance the quantum number of n uh, or the angular momentum being uh, being integer, uh, integer multiple uh, which is n times uh, h bar many of these things were validated later on using the formulations established for quantum mechanics so in that sense yes Bohr's hypothesis was uh, the ideas established were quite correct uh, but you'll also see that some of them were approximations and uh, uh, a rather accurate picture was established uh, or developed based on the mathematical formulation which was established by uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg uh, and Dirac uh, later on uh, when he formulated or when they formulated the, the, uh, the framework for, um, for explaining the dynamics and statistics of, of these uh, microscopic particles. So, In um, 1926, uh, Compton provided the most conclusive confirmation of the particle aspect of radiation. Um, so what he did, he scattered X-ray um, X-rays uh, with free electrons, and what he found that the wavelength of the scattered radiation is uh, usually larger than the wavelength of the incident radiation. Now. This you can explain only if you assume X-ray photons behave like particle. So as you see, uh, you have the X-ray photons and they would have very high energy. Classically, you would assume that this will vibrate the electrons and therefore the electrons will, uh, will emit photon with the same wavelength as the incident photon. Um, but what was found to be very different what was found that you have the electron scatters uh, in the other direction and uh, and as a result of this you have a scattered photon which also comes out from the scattering process and the scattered photon has a wavelength which is uh, which is um, different than the incident photon wavelength um, so as I said, classically you assume that you know the radiation uh, emitted or the radiation incident should have the same uh, wavelength uh, because the X-rays classically will tend to vibrate the electron, um, and uh, therefore you know if the, the the vibration is same as the wavelength of the incident photon, and if the in, in the the scattered photon or the emitted photon is produced because of the vibration of electrons, the emitted photon should also have the same wavelength. But this was not found true and uh, what was found was different as explained and uh, this can be explained or this can be, um, as I said, this can be explained only if you assume that the X-ray photons behave like particle. So this was the, um, the final conclusive confirmation that uh, that particle um, I mean the, the particle aspect of radiation or in other words the radiation also behaves like like particle and uh, I mean a, a, along with many other uh, observations being done in the past um, this this was also added further which was uh, experimental confirmation of uh, what has been shown or what has been told by Einstein or, or Planck in the past 
and this kind of you know all of this set the foundation for you will see later the uh, the wave particle duality uh, proposed by de Broglie and then using this wave particle duality uh, the, the mathematical formulation established by Schrodinger and um, and Heisenberg and, and uh, Paul Dirac and so on. Okay, so moving further, um, as we have seen so far in the photoelectric effect or the Compton effect, uh, radiation exhibited particle-like characteristic in addition to its wave nature. Um, so keeping all of this in mind, in 1923, D. Broglie uh, took things uh, even further and suggested that wave particle duality uh, is not restricted uh, just to radiation but must be universal. It must be associated with every uh, thing which exists in the nature which means the waves, if the waves behave like particle, the particles must also behave like wave. And again, this was an hypothesis and he basically came up with this relation which uh, uh, connects the wave and the, uh, you know, the particle nature of uh, everything present in the nature. So waves are often characterized by a wavelength and particles are often characterized by a momentum. So he gave this relation where uh, lambda is equals to Planck constant divided by the momentum. And uh, he in fact derived it from the fact that, so we saw earlier, we saw earlier that the energy is H nu. And uh, you also know that momentum is E divided by the speed, in this case, if it is speed of light. So momentum is nothing but H nu uh, divided by C. So, uh, and nu by C is nothing by but 1 by lambda. So this gives you P equals to H by lambda, or if you rearrange, you get lambda equals to h by p. So this was the relation which uh, was given by Planck and uh, using this relation he kind of connected um, that the wave and the particle behavior is associated with every uh, element in the nature whether it's, uh, it's a radiation or it's matter. So radiation has particle like behavior um, which you can see from the term momentum and particle has wave-like behavior which you get from the term wavelength. You will see that you know this becomes uh, later on we'll see from the numerical problems that uh, this becomes more meaningful or more evident for microscopic uh, or subatomic particles uh, because you actually see some uh, some reasonably noticeable value of momentum and uh, and the wavelength Whereas if you go for the, um, if you think about the, the, the macroscopic particles or objects um, for which the momentum would be very high because momentum is directly related to mass, something which is massive, the momentum will be very high and as soon as the momentum is very high, the wavelength associated with that will be so small that you cannot observe. For instance, the wavelength associated with, uh, with you know, any uh, uh, observable uh, mass that you see in the nature would be of the order of um, 10 to minus uh, 30 meters and now this is a wavelength which uh, is not observable whereas if you go down to something which is of the size of electron the wavelength associated with this uh, would be something which is noticeable and therefore you cannot ignore that wave particle duality aspect. So that's that's again the same thing which you know I mentioned in the beginning that uh, the quantum mechanics uh, or the classical physics is nothing but the uh, uh, but uh, is an uh, estimation out of uh, of uh, quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is the reality, but uh, when you calculate things uh, based on using quantum mechanics. Um, and when you calculate those things for let's say the uh, the world that we can see with bare eyes 
uh, um, if we get the same uh, values, we get the same numbers, we get the same behavior, we get the same dynamics, but uh, you will see that many of these quantum mechanical aspects become uh, so negligibly small that um, the, what you get from based on by calculating from the quantum mechanics principles versus what you get from the classical mechanics principles uh, would uh, turn out to be the same. So wave particle duality uh, hypothesis of T. Broglie was uh, proven further or in other words the, um, the wave nature of particles was proven further um, um, by Davison, Jumur and Thompson uh, in 1927 from these experiments uh, where in, uh, in Davison, Jumur experiment what uh, the group did so they, for instance, they scattered uh, uh, a beam of electron, uh, a, uh, a 54 electron volt monoenergetic means all the particles have the same energy uh, beam of electrons uh, and they actually had shown a diffraction pattern. Now think in this way that if metal is a clean surface um, and if you uh, if you irradiate with with electrons they should basically go back uh, with the same angle this is what the classical picture tells us right I mean if you if you bounce off a ball on a wall with a certain angle it will bounce back with the same angle in the opposite direction right uh, but what happened in this case uh, was shown to be very different. So you have a beam of incident electrons which are incident with a certain um, angle phi uh, and what was shown that now let's say if I put a, some kind of a plate here, some kind of a fluorescence plate here uh, which basically captures uh, uh, all the electrons which are emitted or which are basically reflected back and uh, wherever the electrons are uh, captured that region starts glowing now if i plot this plate what you see some kind of a diffraction pattern which means that all the electrons did not go to the same point the electrons went to different points and again the this was not random so you had a certain point where you had the maxima and then you had these maxima peaks at different different points which are this. Now this will happen only if the electron behave like, uh, like uh, radiation, uh, not uh, just as particle. Uh, so in other words this kind of interference pattern as we all know uh, from earlier experiments which were done for purely waves uh, that this kind of interference pattern uh, will happen only if the electrons have wave-like properties. Uh, this was further confirmed from uh, a double slit experiment being done for the electron beam. I mean you all know the double slit experiment was initially done for, um, for just the, the, the radiation uh, which was done long back. And the same thing was uh, was then experimented for, uh, but in this case using electron gun. And what was interesting that you know you see a diffraction pattern um, uh, with these electrons having two slits being present. If I explain this further, so let's say you have so what happened if you have just one slit open? If I if I show you this screen here, if I have just one slit open then you see um, just one place where you have all the electrons uh, being uh, captured and only one region where the screen glows. But what happened when you have two slits open, you basically got uh, uh, an interference pattern which means you have these unique regions, these unique regions where they, the electron int intensity was the highest. Now this will happen only if the electron behaves like wave not purely particle if this is just particle let's say if rather having electron uh, gun if you just take uh, a bullet gun 
which means we are talking about massive particles or massive objects, uh, you will not see a diffraction pattern, right? But if you have an electron, you will see a diffraction pattern. Again, this can be correlated back to the de Broglie hypothesis at this relation, which was given by de Broglie, which is nothing but the lambda bar, uh, lambda equals to h by p. Now, if you see, if you have uh, emitted or if you have used electron gun, if you are if you are basically shooting electrons, the momentum uh, is very small because the mass um, is 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 the mass which is responsible for the momentum is very small, which means the wavelength of these electrons are going to be very high. As far as the wavelengths are higher than the spacing between these uh, these two splits, these two slits. Uh, you will get a diffraction pattern. Now, if you shoot uh, a bullet, the bullet will have very high mass, right? So, therefore, the wavelength will come down. And if the wavelength is smaller than the size of the object, and of course, it would be then smaller than uh, the spacing between the two slits and the size of the slit, you will not get a diffraction pattern because these two waves associated with individual particles let's say you have one particle here and the other uh, particle in this case we are talking about uh, actual bullet the the wave associated with this is just confined to this its boundaries and this is spacing is much much let's say this is spacing is l and if l is much 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 greater than lambda then you will not see a diffraction pattern so in reality the wave is associated with uh, with these these uh, uh, macroscopic particles as well but since the spacing between the macroscopic particles is far greater than the wavelength associated with it you won't see uh, uh, interaction between the two waves whereas when you have an electron uh, which has very small momentum and therefore much larger wavelength and also much larger wavelength compared to the size of the particle uh, and the spacing between the two particles the waves are bound to interfere with each other and when they interfere they are going to form these kind of interference patterns. So. Um, Finally, we come to the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which were um, among those uh, last principles uh, being established before the mathematical formulation was, uh, you know, was given by again Heisenberg or uh, or Schrodinger and and Paul Dirac. Um, now, what they did or what he did, um, if you think from the classical physics point of point of view uh, if you have an initial condition and if you know the force acting on a system um, the future behavior which means the unique path of of a system or the direction which the system is moving um, you know so as I said the future behavior of the system can be determined exactly we have seen these uh, these relations uh, um, in high school physics, uh, when you studied the Newtonian mechanics, and if you knew, let's say, certain uh, components of those equations, you were able to derive or calculate the other components. If you knew the present, you were able to basically derive the, the future of that system, where that system is moving, where the system would be, let's say, a few minutes, a few hours down the line, if you know the, the speed and the direction um, or some initial condition of the system. Um, now, all of this is, is, as I said, this is Newtonian mechanics or Newton's second law of, um, of motion, right? And that's why classical physics was um, completely deterministic, right? So let's use this term deterministic here uh, because we are going to talk about uncertainty. Now, what is this uncertainty we are talking about? Um, the question is that the question asked at that time was that is the deterministic view hold for the microphysical world? Um, now, before that, think 
that if you want to do the same thing, if you want to observe a microphysical world, how do you observe? You observe by by physical means, like like let's say if you are ob if you want to observe, or even let's say if you if you want to observe things in the in the macroscopic world, how do you observe? Let's say I see a train moving from point A to point B. How do I observe? I basically see that the light reflects back from the train, comes to my eyes, and I see I I get that uh, reflected light to my eyes as a function of time, and therefore my brain processes where the train was at point A and where the train will be or is eventually is at point B. And using this information, I process the their speed or the time it took and so on and so forth. But the fundamental thing here is that, that there was an exchange of or the interaction of radiation and matter uh, in, the, in the process of I observing the train. If I am seeing the train, the light reflected back from the train and came to my eyes. If there is no light, I can't see the train. I cannot observe the train. So there was a radiation which was basically uh, incident on the object which I'm observing and that incident light reflected back and came to my eyes, right? Now imagine the same, uh, so I mean the, the object is heavy of course bulky and the incident light would not have enough energy that it can change the object, it can change the direction of the object. Uh, the object has very high momentum right um, and therefore the kind of energy required to change the direction of the of the object in the macroscopic world uh, would be very high and that's not possible by you know a uh, few incident photons on that object right whether it's a train or, or an elephant or a bullet or whatever now if you go back to the microscopic world again we are using the same light to observe but now the light may have sufficient energy or the light still has the same energy but the but the required momentum uh, to change the behavior or change the direction of the particle or change the state of the particle comes down drastically because we are now dealing with a very small uh, microscopic entity or, or subatomic entity and since the required momentum is very small whereas the momentum associated with or the energy associated with the light is still the same which now in this case would be much higher than the momentum required uh, to basically change the direction of the particle. Now if you try to observe the direction of the particle using light, what will happen? The moment you observe, you may be able to observe the, uh, the, the position of the particle but you are going to basically transfer certain momentum uh, to that particle and the momentum of the particle uh, uh, that you are trying to observe will therefore change. And that's the, uh, the uncertainty principle here, the uncertainty associated with the fundamental way in which we observe uh, the, uh, the objects around us, whether they are microscopic objects, macroscopic objects or subatomic objects. The, the exchange of energy is is inherently inbuilt in the laws of physics. But the exchange of energy at the macroscopic level are, is so small that the behavior uh, of the particle or the object that we are observing will not change at all. Whereas at the macroscopic level or the subatomic level, the change in the behavior will be noticeable. And that's why uh, if you are trying to probe the position of a particle, um, um you are you are by default going to change the momentum of the particle and that's why this this uncertainty principle so what this uncertainty principle tells so let's say if you have a, um if you have x component of the momentum of a particle you know that you are trying to measure um and the uncertainty in the measurement of the uh, of of the momentum is delta p um, and you're trying to measure the position uh, of of the particle the uncertainty in the measurement of the position will be related to this relation which is delta x
delta x times delta p should will be greater than equals to h bar divided by 2 in other words if i am if i am able to measure uh, the uh, the position with an accuracy delta x then delta x is related to the accuracy with which i measure the momentum is going to be the delta x will always be greater than h bar divided by 2 delta p or in other words if the accuracy in the momentum is delta p the accuracy in measuring the position is going to be h bar divided by 2 times delta p now this is valid for all reciprocal uh, quantities it could be position and momentum it could be energy and the time uh, now this is fundamental to the nature if you are trying to for instance measure the uh, the energy of a particle um, then you won't be able to measure so let's say if uh, if yeah so if you are able to measure if you are trying to measure the energy of the particle um, you won't be able to measure the time at which you get the energy of the particle but before that let's come back to this what does you know let's try to elaborate this further what does it mean what this this relation means this relation means or if i write it differently delta p is equals to or greater than equals to h bar divided by 2 times delta x now if my, if the accuracy of the the uh, the measurement of the position is 100% which means the delta x is equals to 0 then the delta p is going to be infinite which means that if i measure the position with uh, the best possible precision let's say the error is 0 then there will be infinite error in the measurement of the position uh, of the momentum similarly if i can measure the energy of a particle with error being zero right then the time at which i measure the energy would not be known to me which means the error in the time will tends to infinity what does it mean it means that the time at which i measure the energy would not be known to me now this is very different than classical picture in classical picture you can measure this and this with excellent precision at the same time you can measure this and this with excellent precision at the same time but the moment you come down to microscopic world or subatomic world you cannot measure these reciprocal entities or reciprocal quantities uh, at the same time and the error the relation between the error of measuring the two is the heisenberg uncertainty principle and the product of these errors will always be greater than h bar divided by 2 where h is nothing but h bar is h by 2 pi and h is the Planck constant So uh, after the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, let's go to the last slide and uh, then I will conclude this, uh, this module. Um, then came the formulation of, uh, of quantum mechanics. So basically the wave particle duality was very well established. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle was very well established, which uh, further explained the limitations of the microscopic or the subatomic world. Um, the energy quantization was very well established um, so what Schrodinger did and I'll show you in the next module uh, Schrodinger basically came up with this general formulation of quantum mechanics which was again nothing but uh, based on the energy conservation principle but now you know in, in, in the classical energy conservation principle you assume um, uh, an object or a, or a macroscopic object or a macroscopic particle uh, you deal with the macroscopic particle and the momentum associated with the macroscopic particle in this case he assumed that 
rather being a definite entity uh, um, you need to basically take, take a probabilistic entity uh, and therefore you have to come up with the equation which um, uh, which basically can explain the wave like behavior and that's why wave equation and also explains the particle like behavior like the energy con uh, conservation so uh, schrodinger gave this uh, wave mechanics and uh, basically wave mechanics based general general formulation for quantum mechanics um, heisenberg came up with this non relativistic quantum mechanics in fact uh, um, heisenberg and then uh, then further uh, dirac merged general relativity with quantum mechanics and developed this this uh, relativistic quantum mechanics principle so what schrodinger did and what heisenberg did was all non relativistic which means the particles may not be moving with with the very high speeds like speeds close to light um, uh, and their their way of uh, approaching the problem was different the mathematical framework was different but in principle they both uh, talk the same thing and uh, using this uh, you know the merger of the general relativity and the quantum mechanics particularly for particles which are uh, moving with with very high speed and so on uh, Dirac uh, had came up with this non relativistic quantum mechanics where uh, you also account for aspects when the particles are moving at very high speed and this was basically the uh, the foundation for um, uh, for several other discoveries or, or predictions in future for instance uh, prediction of a positron and prediction of uh, annihilation process and so on were all based on the relativistic quantum mechanics positron was in, in fact discovered as i mentioned earlier as well uh, in 1932 by anderson and uh, this was already very well explained by the relativistic quantum mechanics which was proposed by dirac um, Again, uh, the, the pair production, pair annihilation, you know, all of these things were, were very well explained by relativistic quantum mechanics, but cannot be explained by quantum mechanics. And many of these things were experimentally proven further, which were uh, already uh, predicted by the formulation established by Dirac. So this was all uh, as far as the origin of uh, quantum mechanics is concerned. Uh, subsequently, you know, people use these formulations to make several predictions. This, you know, this this entire uh, work of thirty plus years also led to many theoretical predictions. Um, uh, later on, in in the field of particle physics uh, and uh, uh, astrophysics and so on. Um, and uh, what we are going to do is we are going to look into the the aspects which are relevant to uh, semiconductor devices <clears throat> so from next module onwards uh, in the next module we will talk about the uh, the wave mechanics we will we'll use the schrodinger's approach of uh, of uh, formulating the uh, the quantum mechanics or putting the mathematical framework for the quantum mechanics we will use schrodinger wave equation we will solve uh, Schrodinger equation, we will try to understand various boundary conditions and uh, um, we will solve various boundary conditions uh, based problems and uh, to, uh, in this, in the next module we will take it all the way up to hydrogen atom and then I will show you that how the solution of the Schrodinger's uh, equation uh, for the hydrogen atom uh, basically gives you very close results uh, to what uh, Bohr had predicted. Uh, as the model of an atom or the uh, the behavior you know explaining the behavior of electrons in an atom and presenting the model of the atom which can be which uh, can be very well uh, extracted out of schrodinger's wave equation or other mathematical form uh, frameworks being established for quantum mechanics so with this uh, thank you very much and i will see you in the next module